So this uh, PPT I have here is just to recap some of the things and then we will finish up the uh, discussion that we started last week. So this uh, is an image of the sediment and water interface. So a lot of things that we discussed, uh, you can see it here. You can see the uh, interface between water and sediment and you can see the layers of sediment, how it is. This is an image uh, from what is called a sediment profiling camera. So, um, you can see this very light material at the surface which uh, is kind of resuspending a little bit from the natural thing. Okay. This is what uh, sediment looks like when you take it out and people take it out uh, for remediation purposes uh, often. This is a picture, these are images of uh, biotubation. You can see on the left side, you can see worms that are way inside the, uh, this thing and they are burrowing inside and they are coming out. Um, and you can also see that top layer is a bit fluffy compared to the bottom layers. And the second image uh, you can also see is very large animal sitting on the top and the, this also does that. The third image, uh, the idea of this is to show that uh, the, the color between the top layer and the bottom layers are very different. Bottom layer is dark which indicates it is anaerobic. The slightly lighter color on the top uh, which is also there in the first image. <coughs> So this just a recap of some other things uh, what we have already done and this is uh, a, an animation to show the uh, diffusion process. We have water uh, flow there and we have as diffusion occurs from the surface material comes from below and then it tries to re-equilibrate and so on. So again re-equilibrates here and uh, that is the animation. So at any point in time there is a snapshot of uh, material. So the derivation that we did in class, it's all given here. You can uh, go and look at it again. Uh, the solutions and uh, the various complications that we discussed. Diffusion for biotubation. What we are uh, again looking at there's a worm inside the uh, sediment there. So the biotubation material is taken and uh, transported directly. And the model again uh, is that the biotubation layer is seen as a separate uh, model and within that uh, the diffusion is enhanced by the biotubation diffusion as well or you could for this layer, uh, biotubation layer alone you could uh, have uh, just some effective bio diffusion coefficient which is a combination of both. It is very difficult to justify the equation as it is written because Diffusion is occurring in porous medium and biotubation is not occurring in the porous medium in the same process. So they are not essentially the same. So you can club all of this and make it one number and uh, whatever that is. So conveyor belt mechanism is when the worm feeds inside and ejects it out and that is one and it also causes advection channels and solution method. The advection plus diffusion model, we also talked about this and, uh, and these are the different cases where advection can occur, the groundwater flow, tidal fluctuation, ebullition. Ebullition is where uh, gas is formed inside, we discussed that and then biotubation channels. All of this can cause advection, there is a bulk flow that is happening. Uh, we we'll talk about resuspension. This is a very uh, uh, big thing, visible thing. You can see sometimes in shallow waters when there is resuspension, you can see the uh, muddy, uh, different scales. You can see the muddy water. And then we uh, try some concentration can be uh, obtained. Yeah, we did not discuss this in detail, so do not worry too much about it. So, this is uh, a simple. Uh, first order mechanism of erosion and dip deposition. So we have not discussed that in detail. So the, these numbers uh, k deposition and k erosion are uh, similar to the mass transfer coefficients but they are not governed by uh, a thermodynamic gradient. They are more energy balance kind of uh, systems so with sufficient amount of energy and it results in a certain rate of release. So it is derived from an energy balance. In this case, it is mostly uh, experimental. So, so people look at 
and the k deposition is a function of velocity of, uh, of the water, the cohesiveness of the sediment which means uh, it depends on the property of the sediment itself. So, the cohesiveness of sediment can be measured by um, um, different parameters which are solid mechanics based which means the amount of it relates to the amount of energy required to pull it out from one particle to the other particle and then overcome gravity and get out into the air. So, a couple of things there. So, it is not a straightforward <laughs> expression. So, people do not worry too much about it. So, uh, it is a measured thing usually. So, we were uh, stopped here. Last class we were, uh, we, es we essentially said uh, about uh, measurement of fluxes. Okay. So, the measurement of fluxes you can have uh, uh, different things. One is uh, you can have uh, a surface, you are measuring flux at the surface. So, you, you want to measure this. So, you calculate what is the amount leaving coming in. So, this is what is coming in Q and this is uh, what is leaving. The difference between in and out should be the flux. Okay. A lot of times uh, you can get instantaneous flux if you can get instantaneous concentration values okay, very quickly. And one very important thing is this, this boundary, um, this volume is enclosed. Now, this is important because this now is a closed volume system. Okay. Whatever is coming into this closed volume and this is, so what we are doing is we are defining a box here and physically we are defining a box. We are placing a box on a surface and this surface is uh, say is contaminated soil or sediment or water surface and from this surface we are enclosing a surface uh, a, a, a volume over a surface. So, it is like saying if we have a we have a large piece of land here which is contaminated we would like to measure flux I will take a box I will place it on top of it and I will send air water through it and whatever is emission is coming from here it collects into this and it is coming out. So, I am mass balance is very easy for me. I do not have to worry about it. Imagine a case where you do not have a box. I do not have a box. The problem there is uh, I cannot, it is easy for in rivers and all that it is very easy. If, uh, let us say that I am measuring concentration here and I am measuring concentration here. I assume that this is the box and then I can estimate that whatever is the difference between this and this is and this is well mixed this is my assumption. But when you do that there is always a question that how do you know this is coming from here this surface and it is not coming from from the air because I am in, I am neglecting this part or this part. So, when people want to exactly measure flux from a particular surface they would like to isolate that surface alone and verify whether it is uh, coming from that surface. So, then you have to enclose it. Okay. When you enclose it there is a problem in that you are destroying the, uh, the original boundary layer of the system. You are disturbing it and uh, your mass transfer coefficients and everything are based on the boundary layer theory and all that. So, you are disturbing that even though you are getting some estimate of the flux you are still disturbing the original flux, but that is the best. It is a very robust method. It is a very dependable method because uh, what it does essentially is it is giving you evidence that something is coming out. So, for example, if you take the case of contaminated sediments, if you say if you make a, a statement saying that ke chemical X is coming from particular location in the sediment and, uh, um, and that, that means something, it means that somebody who is responsible for that pollution now has to take care of it. So, you are generating evidence of chemical release because of a sediment contamination which means that I have actually go isolate that region and, and give data that there is some flux, some release happening. Whether I can model it accurately using the, the flow and all that is a different story, but this flux data is very useful. Okay. So, similar things ca cases happening right in the, you see that now this big smog uh, thing has come over North India and it is spreading the prediction is it is coming towards the south. Now, the, 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 the conjecture, the hypothesis is that somebody is burning something and that is all coming here. How do you know that that burning is causing this? People will want evidence that because that, that will affect those people's livelihoods. So, they will say 
you please first show evidence that it is being measured and that is what is coming out. So you have to go over to the field and measure. Somebody is burning an agricultural field, you have to go and measure the flux there because we are using box model in an atmosphere system, right. So how much of particulate matter is being released from burning? Simple question. Measurement of this is very complicated because in air, you cannot put a box. If you could put a box, how big a box will you put? If you put a box, the boundary layer in air is destroyed. But if you do not put a box, what is the boundary layer that you will consider? There is a box height that we consider. This is a problem we had in the beginning also, right. So this is a problem. And uh, so people will do at least say, I will at least put a box and measure what is coming. And then we will figure out the rest later. Uh, minimum evidence that it is coming from your agricultural field, I will take a box, put it there. I will send air through it. We will see if anything is evaporating. Simple. Okay. After further arguments can come later. Whether this is uh, amount of evaporation will increase or decrease when you expose it to natural air and all that, you can figure it out from the physics of the system. But minimum evidence is this. Okay. So normally the uh, the enclosed flux method works because this mass balance closure you can exactly tell that surface is responsible for this and then uh, try to understand if this is uh, how different it is from a theoretical uh, uh, system. In any case, the mass transfer coefficient is an empirical quantity. You are not really worried about whether uh, it follows boundary layer theory or not and all that. So, so you can still get something out of it, okay. This is in the laboratory scale, this is something similar to what you would do. You have a sediment uh, in here and you have a, a chamber where water is flowing or water is coming in here and it is flowing across the surface and it, water is getting out. Here I will collect this water and measure what is coming out. So this is the, this is Q rho A in and this is Q rho A out. But in many cases, uh, if you do not have probes to measure what is coming out, in this case we are measuring uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, this is very, very small concentrations of 1 ppm below that. You cannot, there are no probes to measure that. So which means you have to collect 1 liter of water over how much ever time it takes and then extract the water and find out what is the amount of polyaromatic hydrocarbons which are there in this over a period of time that is collected. So here the flux will be is the measure of mass that is collected in a particular time interval, okay, divided by the area and the time interval. So this will be an average flux for the entire time period, okay. You cannot, it is not an instantaneous flux, it is an average flux, but that is fine, that is still, it is still the best data you can get. So in this kind of systems, we work with the best data that is available and extrapolate backwards and models are useful for us to predict uh, based on this data what will happen. There are a large number of uh, other methods in which uh, people try to measure uh, concentration gradients. Uh, concentration gradients are also seen in the model when we saw, before we measure the flux, we measure concentration gradient. We, we actually get rho as a function of z and time. So at any point in time, you should be able to get a concentration gradient. So uh, that is another way of checking if uh, flux is happening in which direction. So you can get a concentration gradient. I can take uh, sediment surface, I can take a gradient, I can take a core and I can measure the concentration as a function of height. And if I see a profile which looks like this, which means that there is a gradient upwards and uh, you can calculate what would have been the flux at the surface based on this. But that still is not, only people who understand diffusion model will understand that. You still need to show evidence that something is coming out. They can also argue that there is something at the surface which will block everything or mysteriously degrade. So, so all arguments that you, you pose as a scientist have to be shown with evidence to, because it is now going into the public domain and into legal domain. So, uh, you cannot say the equation is like this and that therefore this should happen. All that. So evidence is experimental measurement. And that is also a test for the model. You have a model, you are, you are guessing, you are saying uh, this is the probable theory, this is happening. And the experimental data is proof of that. 
So, if the model works with the theory, then you can use the model to predict things which you do not know yet. So, this quick word on uh, contaminated sediment remediation, this is in, in sync with the uh, things that we have discussed in the class for risk assessment. The reason we do risk assessment is whether we want to make a decision on type of remediation option we want to use. And so, this is an example of that. So, there are in for contaminated sediment, there are three options people have looked at. There are very large visible cases in the world, okay. There you can read about it if you want. Uh, there is Rhine Valley, I have mentioned it before in Germany. It is very contaminated river valley because a lot of pharmaceutical companies were there and they cleaned it up. The sediment was cleaned up and uh, also in the US and many uh, fresh water large lakes, great lakes in the between Canada and the United States, very large fresh water system. That and a lot of industries around that, big cities around that, Detroit, Chicago and all that, they are all around that big thing. And there are also the coastal regions that is you will see a lot of coastal industries in India and in, in all over the place, all over the world. So, there is a lot of contaminated sediments and sediments are uh, if it is contaminated it has to be managed because these are also commercial locations. If there is a lot of traffic, shipping traffic is there and then you cannot let it be there because if shipping happens then it is going to resuspend. Resuspension happens, chemical contamination will move from place to place and all that. So, it is a big mess. Uh, so, people look for options for remediation. So, there are three options that people have looked at. One is called as monitored natural recovery. I have spoken about this before. What it means is that this is simply based on the idea of you figuring out using a transport model how much emission is going to occur from the sediment naturally without doing anything. So, essentially we are applying the model which we solved in the last few classes. We predict what is going to be the concentration gradient in the sediment based on the data of measure, measured sediment loading. Then we will predict what is the flux that will come out and based on that we will predict what will be the downstream water quality impairment. Yeah? Now, if you determine that the downstream water quality is not bad you do not do anything, you leave it. And the hope is this this term here is called natural attenuation because what this assumes is that there is going to be biodegradation naturally, slow biodegradation. So, now biodegradation for a lot of organic compounds, biodegradation may happen eventually because there is if you introduce microbial culture, microbial populations will adapt themselves to this and it will take a time, take time for them and eventually it may happen. But there are some chemicals which have been designed to be non-biodegradable. There are human made chemicals which are specifically designed to be non-biodegradable, they are called as refractory chemicals. And in this case the biodegradation will be very slow, it will not degrade very easily and they are designed like that. But you can also imagine that this is the most attractive component for industry who has been asked to clean up. How do you know which industry is responsible for it? So, that we use a, a mix of uh, analytical chemistry. We use what is called as markers. We use markers. Markers are chemical signatures. We, we find in the chemical analysis, we find some chemical which is present in this group and it is com coming only from one particular industry. So, we know that they are responsible for it. So, it is an investigative um, kind of back calculation where you know that this is coming from through, there you ask the regulatory agency will ask that uh, particular uh, entity or, uh, age, uh, or group of corporations or individuals to to clean it up, okay. So, then the cost of cleaning up comes into question. So, this is least expensive because there is nothing needs to be done. It is monitored natural recovery, you have to monitor it from time to time seeing find out whether nothing has changed. What can change? Why do you need to monitor it? So, we discussed it in last class. What can change is it can resuspend and go somewhere else. <coughs> if it is disturbed, it can go and if the first picture we saw in the uh, in the slide show is that sediment surface is very, very flimsy. It will just move very easily and this can happen and people are not very sure that it will move and it can move for 100 different reasons, okay. Somebody will just go take a boat and drive through it and everything will be destroyed. So, people are not very comfortable with this. We people means general public and the regulatory agencies. 
So then the, the other option that they have is what is called as in situ capping. So the monitor natural recovery, uh, the philosophy is leave it alone and nature will take its course. But the nature will take its course if it is below a certain level, that is the rule. If you overload it, it will take more time and it may not happen and that will interfere and that is the general this thing. So this, this here what we are asking here is this, this question of bioavailability is where this uh, makes base essentially uses the partition constant. So we saw in the last class uh, in the model that the initial condition, the flux is a function of flux is proportional to rho A to 0, yeah. Rho A to 0 is a function of Ka32 star, the partition constant. If the partition constant is very high, the rho A2 star will be very small, yeah. And there is an argument that people have made in that the partition constant changes after adsorption. Contamination has happened 20 years back, it has gone into the sediment and nobody has disturbed it and it has now bound irreversibly to the sediment, which means that while adsorbing, it is behaving like one chemical, one partition constant, but the desorption, the partition constant has increased a lot. So essentially this, this is what it means. For example, benzene has a KOC of 1000. So this is the KOC line, the partition constant, which means that the uh, 100 milligrams per kilogram of uh, sediment contamination of benzene will result in a concentration of 0.1 milligrams per liter in the pore water, okay. But if you see that, if it follows this line, yeah, but there is evidence to show that this is now after 10 years or 15 years of contamination, all of this is sitting here. The uh, desorption data is there, which means that the partition constant has now gone there. What it means is that it is now following some other line. So which means it takes a higher concentration, about 100, 100 times higher to give the same concentration, which, which means in other words, it means that this is the concentration that you are likely to find for this particular contamination. So this concentration is much lower than this concentration. So the argument is made that it is not dangerous, it is much safer. So this is one, this is uh, irreversible fraction. So there is a lot of arguments in this, it is not proven. People, um, it is very site specific and these are the theories that are offered, okay. A lot of theories and there is very little, uh, it is still inconclusive. The second option is what is called as capping, in situ capping. This is you put a material, clean material on top of existing. So you, what you do is, this regular release on top of it, if I now put a layer of something, what it does is it will add to the mass transfer resistance. It will add one layer of mass transfer resistance. I can also put a layer, in the case of sand, sand has no very little KOC, no little, very little organic carbon. So it will not absorb anything, it will just offer resistance for movement, poor, poor movement. But if I add a layer which has a clean soil or sediment which has a lot of organic carbon, it will also adsorb and therefore delay, it will delay the breakthrough of uh, the chemicals through it. And one problem with this having a cap is that it increases the depth, decreases depth of the water channel and that is a problem in many places. You cannot have it because there is navigation that is happening there and people are using it for traffic, commercial traffic and all that. So when people have figured out ways of compressing that layer, engineering small thicknesses of this thing. Again, all of this and we have, we have different, uh, in, in, in terms of this, different um, improvements in the type of sand cap and uh, people have invented textile based uh, carpet kind of thing. They will just take it and dump it, put it on the contaminated surface and it has carbon embedded in it. It also has some active ingredients and all that. So essentially you will put a layer on top of the existing sediment. So. It provides, uh, this is like a cap, this, this is a cap, this is a cap, it looks like that, okay. It is a sand cap. One of the arguments against capping is that it destroys the, the essential biological life there. So there is a worm is sitting underneath here and then it would have been on the surface, now it is underneath somewhere, it has become more anaerobic and that will change the biogeochemistry of the entire region and it will have other consequences. So this is always the argument for intervention in, in nature. So what this does is in terms of our model, it does this. So it has now added. So normally in our original model, we did not have 
uh, we did not have uh, we had these two layers biturbation and uh, we did not have this now we have this additional layer so so we have to now model in each of these two layers and this is of course the boundary layer the the uh, surface boundary layer so each of these layers have to be done separately so what we do is a simplified steady state approximation we say the flux is now some function some overall mass transfer coefficient multiplied by the sediment concentration here this is uh, rho a to 0 and it jumps from here to here across these three resistances and these three resistances are indicated by the cap the biological and the the, the usual ka23 that that is the surface mass transfer coefficient and we get uh, ex estimates of the uh, resistances by the by these terms here this is the diffusion coefficient divided by the um, this is an, a mass transfer coefficient dA by L divided by the re retardation factor the adsorption okay. So this is used in the design so the model is used in the design of the cap so you would like to know what is the thickness of the cap that I need to use so that you can make simulations like this if I have no cap this is going to be the emission if I use a 1 meter sand cap this is going to be the emission if I use 1 meter sediment cap this is going to be the emission so you design so for 100 years look at the x axis time scale we are, we are modeling for 150 years 200 years you really do not know what is the time for which you should design to but this, this is shown you can also compare different types of capping material you can compare soil versus activated carbon versus coke versus sand you can also find out what is the thickness how much do you need and all that right. The last method is called dredging this is dredging you have seen this a lot uh, here dredging is used for land reclamation a lot of dredging this is non remedial dredging environmental remediation dredging is different because uh, you can see one of the problems in dredging is falling so the mechanical dredging uses what is called as a uh, the, this is this is called as a bucket head bucket head dredge this one it is what you have seen commonly here it is like a thing it goes in poops up and comes out and so mechanical it retains the solids very effectively so all the water is gone out only the solids retain, retain it is like a scoop problem is it uh, you can imagine while it is doing this it will generate a lot of cloud resuspension in this region so you can see it here the water is coming out the water is muddy it is already dirty the other option is what is called as a um, hydraulic dredging this, uh, this one in this they use uh, <coughs> some kind of a uh, what do we call a screwdriver kind of thing it is like a drill so it is gently drilling it but at the same time when it drills it creates a small slurry there locally and a slurry is pumped into this white line you can see this white line here uh, that is the pump it is pumping the slurry out of the re region so it generates much less resuspension what is the consequence of that generates much less uh, resuspension at the site but as a result of which it is generating a slurry which you have to deal with it later because that slurry is contaminated now and that has to be dealt with later okay. Here you know it is not generating much slurry for you to process it is only solids that are placed in a barge and taken away. <coughs> but it generates a lot of resuspension and this plume can travel from place to place. So this is what it looks like a dredging site can look like this very highly uh, turbid what can happen from this turbid uh, this thing so they, they are isolating it they are isolated it by uh, blocking flow from that area so that, uh, it, that, that so that it does not spread does not spread so this yellow thing is called as a silt curtain. So this can happen when you really when you are dredging chemicals can release into the uh, water and we discussed this then it can dissolve it can resuspend and then during resuspension desorption can happen if it dissolves then it can also evaporate and can move okay. So the environmental impact is the following you are dredging based on the dredging mechanics depending on what dredge you use you generate a turbidity for unit volume dredge and then this, this results in a suspended solid concentration in the water from the suspended solids concentration this chemical contamination that is present on the suspended solids will result in the contamination of the water and an aqueous concentration through desorption from here it can 
evaporate and have an evaporation emission of this particular chemical and then it can cause an air pollution impact which you can estimate using dispersion. So you have this entire sequence of uh, operations that you can uh, look at. So we are going to skip all of this. So what happens to the dredged material when it leaves a dredging site? So it has to go somewhere, it is not finished. You are just removing it from there and you have put it somewhere else. So it is usually placed in something called as a confined disposal facility, like a landfill you can see, it is somewhere, placed somewhere, yeah. But there one of the things that happens when it is being filled, it can evaporate, materials can evaporate from it, okay. And it can evaporate from a solid uh, soil like structure and it can also evaporate from the suspension that is present here. Uh, both of these are, you can model both of these by equations that you have already seen. Um, and when it is completely filled, it looks like soil. Some region of it is unsaturated, some of it is saturated, all of it probably is unsaturated at some point in time. So it now resembles soil. So this is a very dynamic system. It keeps filling as it is filling. It starts from a river like, lake like system and then it goes to a soil like system and all that. So there is, so the excess water is removed and that goes to an effluent treatment plant. But this is of interest to do whether, how much of it will evaporate. So this is done over a long period of time. You cannot have small, small regions. So you are dredging and dredging happens over a long period of time. So the time scales invo involved here are of the order of several months, several years sometimes to fill up. And as a result, uh, what we are interested in again this, while it is sitting in the, in the confined disposability, it will dry. So when it dries, our model of evaporation uh, contaminant transport now depends on whether it is evaporating diffusion through poor air or through poor water and all this. this these combinations exist and so on. So you can predict whatever is the total diffusion in the system, what is the diffusion in poor water and what is the diffusion in poor air and the total flux based on that. So it is possible for us to do this. Okay. The other kind of natural systems that you see this happening is in what is called as mud flats. As you see a lot of this in, in India, it is very common. It is a river bed or a lake bed or uh, this thing. It has water. Very nice. When water goes away, you it's uh, the bottom soil is exposed, and then the bottom soil is exposed, and uh, evaporation can occur directly from this, and that is one thing. And this you can see another example of a mud flat. Uh, there's water here, and there is no water here. It's receding, and then when the water comes back, so this is again the thing that we discussed last class. The effect of when this kind of thing happens, moisture content in the soil is changing as a result emission will change. The partition constant is changing, this is changing. And this experiment is done in the lab where it shows that there is a chemical called bio-dibenzofuran and this is experimental data. This, when the mud is dry and this is the model, the blue line is the model that shows and then at some point we dry the surface by sending in dry air. So the water content increases, the, the water flux increases because it is now being dried and then the water increases and then everything is dry. During this period you see that the flux drops down, the, the flux for the dry period is down here, it is dropped down several factors. Okay. Then again when you heat it with humid air it goes back up here. Okay. So this is the illustration of this, when the partition constant changes, the flux changes. Okay. And the, Okay, now this is uh, the flux when you when you are able to measure the flux using a box, putting a box on it. As, as I mentioned that a lot of times you cannot do that and at the time when you cannot do that you have to leave it open. When you are, when you have a surface and you have to measure the flux and it is difficult for you or it is unreliable for you to enclose a surface, you need to measure, still measure the flux and we do it by what is called as a uh, gradient technique or a micro meteorological technique. <coughs> I am just going to uh, talk a little bit about it, aerodynamic uh, technique. It is also called as a gradient technique. So for example, 
if you, you can do this inside the sediment soil right i can take a gradient if i may if i know the concentration of pore vapor at z equals to z1 rho a1 at z equals to z2 if there is a difference i can uh, i can use uh, minus da d rho a1 by dz i can use uh, da do d rho a31 by dz i can use this equation solution of this equation to calculate what is the flux if i know the diffusion coefficient okay which basi basically i am using a gradient to calculate a flux yeah the idea here is can you do the same thing here you can't this but the mechanism is not the same what is happening here is this is turbulence that is happening and turbulence is happening in convex eddies that are that this kind of structure that is managed moving in this direction right. What we are taking advantage of here is that we would like to see if there is a vertical component of the fluid that is going up in the upward direction yes this is convective mass transfer right. This is convective mass transfer and therefore we are trying to take advantage of the convective mass transfer component in the z direction to see what is the concentration difference and we also see if we can somehow measure the net flux based on that concentration difference at a given location okay because it is moving in this direction but there is one component that is moving in this direction also okay not clear this is this is uh, the essence of the uh, convective mass transfer argument is that it, the transfer is happening in the there is a gradient in this direction right there is a gradient in this direction when we measure it we will we'll see that the gradient the, there is a gradient that that appears concentration gradient that appears like this it is very high at the surface and it is decreasing away from the surface yeah because material is being carried from the surface upwards this way and that this concentration boundary layer that is assumed to be formed is based on but this is not happening at the same place it is moving down okay but if you take a large area and you measure the flux here so this gradient is already formed gradient is already forming uh, right from the beginning of this contaminated zone mass transfer has started taking place and so by the time you arrive here there is a gradient that exists and based on that gradient you can calculate if there is a flux for that you need to know what is the vertical structure of the of the air so this is the uh, essence of the uh, the reason why we are uh, we do this is the equation called thonthwaite holzman equation this is also the basis for the uh, the estimation of dispersion parameters in air mold okay this uh, because that's also based on the same thing it's vertical structure of air turbulence uh, in the air and therefore how does material move in the y direction and z direction as a result of this kind of convective uh, behavior so the equations don't worry too much about it will uh, the essence of this is this in turbulent this things the idea is that velocity has a gradient we already know velocity has a gradient with height and this the structure of this gradient is this form usually it's a logarithmic relation vx vx is direction velocity in the x direction it is a function of z but in this as a logarithmic function of z and the proportionality constants this is called as v star v star is called as the friction velocity okay the friction velocity is defined as this uh, shear stress at the surface divided by the density and uh, yeah based on this equation you can derive this from here based on this i can i can derive this expression you can see it for yourself how it's done it is essentially the difference in the velocity divided by the log of the uh, height so there is this two quantities here called y0 and d so don't worry about them so you can assume d is to be 0 d is what is called as zero displacement we are at sea level there is no if you are at normal ground level there is no zero displacement what it essentially is zero is some for example if you are on top of a mountain the zero displacement will be the height of the mountain so that is that is what it means but the roughness height uh, z0 is z0 the roughness height is something that is dependent on the what is structures available on the surface so for example you have grass or your trees the boundary layer does not go to zero nicely at the at ground zero it it will stop 
somewhere slightly above depending on what is the nature of the surface okay so that's called as a roughness height so therefore uh, z0 at z0 the velocity is supposed to be zero we are assuming that's the surface that's the assumption we make in boundary layer that at the z equals zero velocity is zero that's why you don't see another now v vx minus so so this, the generalized expression is this one this vx minus one other v term is there where we don't assume that the second z is zero so what this means is that if you make velocity measurements at two heights z1 and z2 they will likely follow this expression yeah if it follows this expression then the, the quantities v star and v star can be calculated from that okay so v star is the friction velocity which you can obtain by the velocity gradient in a given location right now from here you can calculate tau based on this equation okay now tau 0 is uh, expressed in terms of the uh, newton's law at the surface by this minus of rho this one is the kinematic viscosity usually we use the term uh, we use a different symbol but the v and that looked very similar so i changed it it is kinematic viscosity and then this is the uh, mass flux now you see that the signs are opposite for mass flux and the momentum flux because they are in the opposite direction the momentum flux is traveling uh, upwards mass flux is going down or reverse in this case the reverse case okay mass is going out momentum flux is uh, coming down there is a loss of momentum downwards okay. velocity is decreasing towards the surface mass is increasing away from the surface so the distinct change in sign okay so it's all there you don't have to write it down it's uh, so we are trying to go towards the derivation where so we use this we use these two equations we take the ratio of these two we will get this equation and then we substitute tau 0 we substitute this expression tau 0 into this expression now to get this big big expression what we are trying to do now is we are trying to get an expression for flux as a function of the velocity and the concentration gradients yeah so we have measurements of concentration at two heights velocity at two heights that will give us some idea of the uh, structure v star the turbulent structure of the thing and then we are using these terms here when there is neutral conditions which means that there is no neutral condition means stability is neutral there is no thermal forces pushing up and down no buoyancy effects the terms dA and this are supposed to be similar they are the same dA T and uh, kinematic viscosity and diffusivity are assumed to be same see this dA T is not molecular diffusion it is turbulent diffusion it is some other number okay turbulent diffusion we use we use the fixed law structure very nicely because it is we are using gradients so we will we will use the same fixed law structure but it is not molecular diffusivity anymore it is some diffusivity it is turbulent diffusivity so what this does is here I can calculate the flux from a surface using this equation yeah gradient it's called a gradient method this only works as long as there is no thermal forces for that there is something called as the modified Thonthwaite Holtzman equation when you have thermal forces you bring into this question uh, so all font is all become very scary font anyway you can see it there is something called as the monin abukov length scale this comes up there also you can uh, if you read the uh, there is one page set of things i have put in your uh, if you are interested you can read it and if you go and read ermod's derivation so the, this monin abukov length scale comes there so this is lm this is physically the length scale at which the production of turbulence by buoyancy effects are of the same order of the shear stress so the buoyancy becomes that important here um, and then it is defined as this lm is defined as this so if you look at this carefully there is a this is a ratio of this kind of this is the friction velocity which is the turbulent length scale what is in the denominator is a q0 q0 is the positive heat flux into the atmosphere how do you get a heat flux what do you need for heat flux you need a you need a temperature gradient yeah 
So the temperature gradient comes into question here. To calculate LM, you need two at least two measurements of temperature. You need a temperature gradient also. Yeah. So LM is that. So the, there's a negative sign here. Depending on whether a temperature gradient is this way or this way, you can define the stability is defined uh, on the magnitude of the values of the LM. The stability is defined on basis basis of that, not just the uh, the lapse rate anymore. So the, the, we on based on this we define a bunch of other things. So we add a correction factor called as phi m. This is the original equation that we have. To this we add this correction factor called phi m which is now dependent on the stability as well. And this when we have a bunch of equations where we calculate phi m for different values of psi. In the equation previous by this, this number is dependent on z by lm. Z is any height. At any height the comparison of that height with uh, the lm. You can get this values of uh, psi and phi m um, based on uh, this lm. The other option to do this instead of lm you can also use what is called as a Richardson number. The Richardson number is defined like this. You see there is a temperature gradient in there. So when you plug all of this in back into your main equation you will get one big equation which now has three gradients. You have a velocity gradient, you have a concentration gradient and a temperature gradient which now takes into account everything and now gives you a value of flux. So this final expression, the corrected expression for the uh, flux at a surface is given by this where the temperature gradient is implicitly sitting here inside this, in, in this uh, equation. Okay. Here also you can assume dA to, uh, and D, this this is a problem. If you assume that to be one, then uh, of course phi m value will take care of the rest of it. So this is a bit, uh, it's not a very accurate method as you can see, because depending on uh, how much, how many measurements you are making, there will bound to be errors in this and uh, and the way we do it. But this is the best we have got at this point. And uh, added to this the problem that. Uh, the concentration measurement sometimes you do not get instantaneous concentration measurement. You can get instantaneous velocity and temperature, you cannot get instantaneous concentration which means that all this is velocity may be changing because it is turbulent but you cannot use that. You, can, you have to wait for the time scale at which you are measuring your concentration gradient. So it is inaccurate that way but it will still give you an estimate of what the flux is. You can add a factor of 10 if you want for conservative measure. It will. So what people do is they, they have a mass, this is a this is the gradient measurements. You can have a mast of different measurements at multiple locations in a given area. So you get this the flux that you get is only for this location and flux you get for this location. So then you get an average over an area. You all to do all this because you are now you are you are unwilling or it is not correct for you to enclose the given air amount of air in order to measure uh, flux from a given surface. Okay. Physically it will look like this, there is a, an experiment, a field experiment that was done where you have contaminated mud or something like that and it is releasing. So you have this mast here you can see uh, and each of this there are different uh, locations where we have measurements of the uh, chemical, the wind speed, temperature, everything. And so massive exercise, so you have to put it, so people have done this over different surfaces, they have done it over water, they have done it over agricultural fields, they have done it over this thing. So this works for vapor phase, okay. For particles it is a different story because particles have aerodynamic behavior and they would not behave nicely, it does not go up nicely. Only particles below a certain size will go up nicely. Particles above 1 micron, 2 microns they will, they will even deposit on top of your uh, sampling device and all that. So it is a bit difficult to do all that, okay.